Now we want to talk about energy performance indicators. So the question is, why do we need performance indicators? On the one hand, we want to, to rate the quality of an energy system. Um, is it a high quality energy system? Of course, we need to define what is a good system, what is a bad one. And um, on, the, on the other hand, we want to compare different systems um, like a coal power plant and the wind turbines. And of course, we want to compare uh, systems of the same uh, type uh, to decide which, for example, PV system has a better quality. Um, what are typical performance indicators? Of course, first of all, the efficiency of a system, so the ratio of what you get from a PV system over uh, the energy of the power you put into your system. Then we will talk about uh, full load arrows and then peak load arrows. There's the capacity factor and the load factor uh, to rate uh, um, an energy system. We have the demand or utilization factor and the reserve factor, which is uh, used as an indicator, the diversity factor, and finally, uh, the temporal and the technical availability is one of, of these uh, performance indicators. The efficiency of an energy system is the ratio between the useful output of an energy con conversion machine and the input, so you see the equation, um, ether, the efficiency is the ratio of the energy or the power you get from a system over the energy or the power you put into a system. So, for example, um, for coal power plant, you have the energy stored in hard coal, uh, which is burned and used for uh, boiling the water, uh, and the power is what you get from the turbine and the generator. On the right hand side you see two examples on the one hand the efficiency of a light bulb so you add electric energy to the light bulb and what you get is just uh, five percent of the energy is just converted to to visible light and um, that's the useful uh, type of energy on the other hand you get uh, you have a lot of losses um, the bulb is uh, heated and uh, this is 95%. So the efficiency of a light bulb is just 5% because just 5% of the electric energy is converted to light. On the other hand, the efficiency of a Carnot circle, um, so um, the, uh, the machine um, which is converting heat to, uh, to work, um, this energy, you know this from thermodynamics, is um, the energy you get uh, wc so that the work the machine can do over the heat you add uh, to the machine uh, or on the other hand of course it's the, the one minus the ratio of the uh, two temperatures so the lower temperature um, and of course the higher temperature in the table you can see different uh, typical energy uh, efficiency values for uh, energy systems so uh, steam power plants nuclear and coal they have an efficiency of 30 40 maybe 45 percent um, then of course we have this ccgt power plants so uh, gas power plants Combined gas and steam power plants, 50 to 60 percent. Wind turbines have an efficiency of 50 percent. Wind uh, the PV systems, uh, due to the low efficiency of solar modules, they have just a total efficiency of 15 up to perhaps 20 percent. Hydropower is one of the most efficient energy systems we have, as 80 to 90 percent of the energy is converted to electric energy. Uh, then a petrol engine uh, in a car, for example, has just an efficiency of 10 to perhaps in, on the best conditions 45%. So uh, most of the energy stored in the petrol or gas is uh, is, is lost. Um, light bulb 5%, and then finally a fuel cell um, just has an efficiency of 20 to 60%. So again, the conversion of, of hydrogen uh, to electricity is. Uh, has just a rather low efficiency of uh, 20 to up to 60 percent if you use uh, the heat which is generated uh, during this uh, process. To define the next energy performance indicators, first of all, we need to talk about uh, load, so the energy demand of a system over a time period, or on the other hand, the uh, electricity generation. Uh, 
of a PV system or a coal power plant uh, over a time period. So what is the slope of these, uh, of these uh, profile curves? What you can see here are um, nine different uh, profiles for households. So that's a standard load profile um, provided by the German Association of Energy and Water Industry, BDEW. And what you see is uh, the, the load profile, the standard load profiles uh, are separated in nine different types. So on the one hand, we have uh, winter, we have the transition, so spring and autumn, and we have uh, the summer. And on the other hand, we separate the load profiles in the working days, so Monday to Friday, Saturday and Sunday, or public holidays. So public holidays are uh, counted like as, as Sunday. And then you see the typical load profile of households. Um, for example, for workday in winter, you see uh, during the night until 6 a.m. we are on the low level then we have this increase of energy demand in a household with a peak at uh, let's say 8 a.m. then a slight drop then at, at, at noon um, preparation of lunch at uh, 1 p.m. then a drop in the afternoon then the high p uh, the large peak at uh, 7 or 8 p.m. and then the drop um, during the the late afternoon uh, the late evening and at night. And these are, or these standard load profiles have been provided over several years or decades. So they represent a typical uh, household. Um, and these profiles can be used, for example, to generate um, a profile for uh, one year, for example, for a time period by using and uh, combining these nine different load profiles to a full load profile over a specific time period different standard load profiles have been provided by the German Association of Energy and Water Industry. So what you can see here in this table are the different profiles. Um, we've talked about the households, so representing a typical household in, in Germany. Then there are eight different profiles um, representing the business. So G0 is business in general, so a mixture of different business types. Um, then we have uh, the profile G1, so this profile represents a business uh, which is working mainly on uh, weekdays from Monday to Friday from uh, 8 to um, 4 p.m. Um, then we have a G2, for example, a business with a predominant evening consumption. Uh, G3 is a business which is running on a constant level even for uh, 24 hours. So there is no big difference between day and, and night operation. Then we have shops, uh, G4, a bakery uh, with a G5 and a G6 is a business with uh, mainly a weekend consumption. Uh, and finally G7 is a rather new one, a cell tower, um, which uh, uses energy. Then we have uh, three different profiles uh, representing ag agriculture. Um, L0 is agriculture in general, and then we differentiate between dairy farms or farms with the livestock. This is L1 and L2 are all other types of agriculture usage. And by using these profiles, um, you, you can provide uh, the, the uh, load profile over time period per day on a 15 minute based uh, interval and uh, then you can generate a default load profile uh, for these uh, different systems uh, over time period like for for month or even for a year in this figure you see um, the energy production curve of hard coal power plants on the day in february in germany so this is the um, power generated uh, per time interval um, what you see is here on the one we have the peak power PP um, so the highest uh, power uh, in a time interval over the time period of about 13.4 uh, gigawatts we have the time period in this case of uh, 24 hours so um, uh, of course you can can use a time period of, of uh, several days a week a month a year or a shorter time period in this case we use uh, 24 hours 
And what you want to know is, of course, what has been, uh, what is the energy produced by this energy system. So what you need to do is uh, you take the power per time and integrate this power over the time period from uh, the beginning to the uh, end of the period. So you need to uh, calculate the, the, the integral of the power or if you have discrete values uh, for the um, for the energy production of the power, uh, typically uh, the energy utilities provide the data on a 15 minute uh, interval. You multiply this power with the time, then you get an energy and then you sum up all these, uh, these values and get the total energy uh, which has been produced uh, in this time interval. And then uh, this um, a dashed marked curve or this uh, yellow rectangle represents uh, the, the value of the mean power. So what is the mean power over uh, this time period? Of course, you, you take the energy over this time period and divide this value by time and then you see what is the mean time or what is the mean power over this time period. Um, so if the system ha would have run on a constant level, uh, you see this is uh, close to 10 gigawatts. So that is the mean uh, the mean power of this uh, system. You can see the electric power generation in 2019 in Germany. So the um, profile of the power generation of all energy systems we have in, in Germany. So see on the Y or on the, on the Z axis the power which is running between uh, 35 and up to 80 gigawatts. And the colors represent the different uh, power values. Yellow is a high power and blue colors represent a smaller power. And what you see is on the one hand uh, the hours on the one um, axis uh, running from um, the beginning of the day until the end of the day, so 24 uh, o'clock. And uh, on the other hand you see the days um, running from uh, the 1st of January until the 31st of December and then you see the typical slope of the curve so uh, higher values of course at noon uh, smaller values uh, during the the night and on the other hand you see the profile that the energy demand or the electric uh, power generation is uh, larger uh, in uh, in the winter time due to a higher demand uh, for um, uh, the, the the lightning uh, and on the other end, a smaller uh, power generation in summertime, um, so a smaller um, demand we have in, in Germany overall. Next, we want to talk about full load hours and uh, peak load hours. So again, we have the profile of the hard coal power plants in Germany on a day in February, um, shown in this blue curve. Uh, we have uh, the peak power uh, of the system and what we now do is on the one hand the peak load hours that is this uh, light red rectangle, rectangle represent the time um, the systems would run at this peak power of about 13 uh, gigawatts. Um, so we divide the energy produced in our time intervals so over the, the, the 24 hours and divide this value by the peak power and then we get the peak load hours. So this value represents uh, the time if the systems would have run for uh, this time period at the peak power value, so 13 gigawatts, um, then they produce this amount of energy and then the, the system would stop operation and uh, don't produce anything, the, the power would drop to zero. So that is that is the representation of the meaning of this peak load hour. On the other hand, what is more used more in general are the full load hours. So what you do is you take the maximum capacity, the maximum power the systems have. In this case, it's uh, 55.3 gigawatts. That's the maximum power of all hard coal power plants in Germany. Of course, you don't reach this value, so the peak power, of course, is always smaller than the maximum power. But the full load hours are representing the time period if the system would run at this maximum power uh, for this uh, time uh, interval. So you divide, the, you take the energy uh, produced within 24 hours or a month, a year. You take the energy and divide this by this uh, maximum power, Pmax. 
And this represents, or this value, the fluid also represents the value that the system would run at maximum power. In this case, uh, for, uh, let's say, about uh, nine and a half hours. And then the system would stop running, so there is no power anymore. And that is uh, that are the full load hours. Of course, the rect angle, the, the yellow rect angle and the light red re rect angle represent the energy because it's power times time that represents the energy of the system uh, produced. And of course, the area of these uh, two rect angles are the same. Um, the full load hours are, of course, always smaller than the peak load hours as the power we use. Uh, of the f using to calculate the full load hours is, is, is larger than the power we use for the peak load hours. Now we want to make a quick example to calculate the full load hours of a system. You see the equation. Uh, so the full load hours are uh, the ratio of the energy produced by a system within a time period over the maximum capacity or the nominal power. So let's let's make a quick example. The uh, Nominal power of the coal power plant is, uh, let's say, 400 megawatts, and this system has produced 1.4 terawatt hours within one year. So the question is, what are the full load hours in this case? So uh, what you can do is just uh, stop this video for a moment and do this calculation on your own, uh, and then uh, continue with the video. So what uh, what do we do? What what is the calculation we we need to do? Uh, so we have Tf is the energy, so that's 1.4 terawatt hours over the capacity 400 megawatts. Uh, and now uh, let's change the prefix of the energy, so that is 1,400,000 megawatt hours. So of course you need to be familiar with these prefixes. And what you now directly see is why the unit of watt hours is very helpful um, in the energy uh, business because now we can directly derive uh, the hours. Uh, you do not need to uh, use joule and watts and then get seconds and then transform the seconds uh, to, to hours. And what we want to get is we want the hours. So that is the reason why this unit megawatt hours or watt hours is very helpful in the energy business. So if you do this calculation, uh, this are 3,500 hours. So what does this mean? Well, if the system has a full load hours of 3,500 hours. So if you make a quick sketch, we have the time and we have the power. So overall, in one year, we had 8,760 hours. That are the hours uh, over one year, 365 days, 24 hours. And in our case, our system is running for 3,500 hours at the maximum power. So that's the maximum power of 400 uh, megawatts. So here we have 400 megawatts. And the system is running now with this maximum power for 3,500 hours, and then the system is stop, uh, st stops running, so there is no energy generation anymore. We are here at the bottom, and uh, the energy produced, this is this rectangle, of course. That's the maximum power times uh, the time, gives us the energy of 1.4 terawatt hours and this is a helpful uh, indicator the full load hours to compare different uh, energy systems like uh, steam power plants or wind turbines hydropower plants for example uh, as you can use these um, these full load hours to compare the different uh, systems the full load hours of different energy production systems in germany are shown in this figure so what you see is on the one hand, or what has been used, is the energy production in 2019. And the nominal power of these systems is taken at the end of 2018. Uh, the data have been provided by the Fraunhofer Ezer. Um, and what you see is uh, the energy systems with the uh, largest full hour value are nuclear powers, uh, power plants with the... Um, full load hours of more than 7,000 hours. So these are the systems for providing the, the base load of the energy demand. 
um, with the bioenergy, so using biomass uh, to generate electricity with the uh, full hours of uh, 5500 hydropower and as well uh, lignite power plants or light uh, coal, brown coal power plants with the uh, large volume. So these four energy systems provide the base load. They have a, a large uh, full load hour value. And then we have uh, the wind power uh, in Germany with the full load hours in 2019 of uh, slightly more than 2000 uh, full load hours. Then we have the hard coal power plants. So they are uh, used in the German and the European uh, grid. Uh, to provide uh, the the mid uh, the, the medium uh, load, which is changing over uh, daytime, um, so the coal power plant, hard coal power plants reach uh, full load hours of close to two thousand uh, hours. Then we have the natural gas power plants providing peak uh, power. Uh, in this case, we have uh, peak uh, the full load hours of. Uh, about 1,700 hours. And then finally, uh, the second volatile energy system, uh, photovoltaics, which have a full load hours of about 1,000 hours, uh, providing, of course, uh, the energy only during daytime and mainly in summer and not in winter. And as you see with this uh, in this diagram, on the, one, uh, the different types of energy systems, the base load power plants, or the power plants providing the base load, and of course, we have the uh, volatile systems, wind and uh, photovoltaics, uh, medium and the uh, peak load uh, providers, uh, hard coal and uh, natural gas power plants. Next, we want to introduce uh, the capacity factor and the load factor. Uh, so uh, what you want to do is you want to have a factor, an indicator, which is uh, unit less. Uh, the load hours have the unit hours. And what you want to have is a factor or an indicator which has no unit so it's just representing a percentage. What we have is again the profile of the hard coal power plant energy production on a day in February. We have the peak power uh, in the morning, PP. We have the maximum power of all hard coal power plants of uh, 25.3 gigawatts in this case. And then, first of all, we will do, define the capacity factor CP. So that is the ratio of its actual output over the time period to its potential output. So what does it mean? It's similar to the uh, load hours or the full load hours in this case. So we take the energy which has been produced within the time interval, divide this by the nominal power and divide this by the time period. So what we take is we take the full load hours and divide this by the period. Of course, this value uh, can be um, also be written as the mean power over the maximum power. This value, of course, is always smaller um, than 1. On the other hand, the load factor is defined in a similar way. Uh, we have FL of the load factor. This is the energy divided by the peak power in this case, not the maximum power, but the peak power uh, and the time period. So we have TP, so the peak load hours divided by the time period, or in the other way, the mean power divided by the peak power PP. Of course, also this value is smaller than 1. And both values are used, mainly the capacity factor, like the full load hours uh, are used, um, as they represent the amount of energy uh, energy system can provide and generate. So again, let's make a quick example. Um, let's calculate the capacity factor for a nuclear power plant. So see again the equation of the capacity factor, the energy pro produced within a time period over the maximum power or the nominal power of the system and the time period. So you take the full load hours and divide this by the time period, a day, a month, a week, a year, whatever. Or what you could also do is to, to derive the capacity factor, take the mean power and divide this by the maximum or the nominal power. So let's make a quick example. We have a nuclear power plant with a capacity of 1.3 gigawatts. And uh, let's think about that this system has uh, produced 7.2 terawatt hours of energy within one year. So what is the capacity factor? Again, just make a quick break of the video and do the calculation on your own. And um, then we can have a look at the values. So what we get is we have CP, this is the energy, so the energy is 7.2 terawatt hours 
over and then we have the nominal uh, power this is 1.3 gigawatts so this equation would uh, give us uh, the full load hours and then we take the time period one year that is 8760 hours and if you do the calculation you get 0 0.632 or 63.2 percent so that is the capacity factor again this value of course represents uh, the, uh, the period you see here in this uh, sketch we have the time we have the power so the system is running at maximum power so 1.3 uh, gigawatts and then uh, stops operating so that is the energy uh, and then we are at zero power output with 8760 hours. So that gives us an information uh, about the full load hours and the capacity factor is just the ratio uh, of these hours over the overall hours. And that's in this case 63.2% uh, of the year the system's running at uh, full power. Um, so this is 100% of the time period. This is here 63.2% of the time period um, and of course the nuclear power plant uh, provides uh, the energy for the base load or base energy demand so the capacity factor is rather large one issue about the capacity factor is the question how is uh, the time period defined so again you see the equation for the capacity factor the energy produced by system over the nominal power p max times the time interval or the full load hours or the time period um, and now the question is what's about this time period how to how to define this um, let's make an example for a pv system so let's have the example that this pv system has installed a capacity of 100 kilowatts and the system is producing 100 megawatts in one year um, so the question is what are or what is the capacity factor so what we need to do is um, on the one hand uh, if we do this uh, like we do this for um, hard coal power plants or other power plants we take 8760 hours um, what do we get so cp is the energy so 100 megawatt hours over the capacity 100 kilowatt times the time period 8760 hours and this gives us 11.4 uh, that is the uh, definition we use in general. But now you can argue, yeah, wait a minute, the PV system cannot run for 8,760 hours as we just need the sunshine hours, in this case here, uh, 1,500 hours in Germany, as the system is just able to generate um, electricity in this time period. So we, we should use this time period 1500 hours instead of the full year of 8760 hours and if we do this calculation for example um, what do we get 100 megawatt hours over 100 kilowatt times 1500 hours and that gives us 66.7 percent so even larger capacity factor within the range of uh, for example nuclear power plants um but of course, what you do is you have this energy production in one year um, and then you take uh, the the overall hours of the time period, which is defined. So this on the left hand side, this is the um, typical calculation of the capacity factor to uh, compare different energy systems. If you say the energy has been produced within one year, you take this time period of 8760 hours and you do not change uh, this time period to in this case 1500 hours so for pv system or for wind system uh, or whatever um, you always keep to the same base of time uh, period in this case for one year 8760 hours of course the capacity and the load factor depend on uh, external parameters in this example we have a pv system on the one hand on a clear sky day perfect weather conditions no clouds and on the right hand side on a cloudy day heavy rain uh, and less energy production and what we want to do is we want to 
derive the capacity factor, so the energy produced within a time period over the nominal power times the time period. And on the other hand, we want to calculate the load factor, FL, as the energy produced within a time interval over the peak power times the time interval. So let's do this. In this example, we have a nominal power of this PV system of 46.6 kilowatts. Uh, on this clear sky day, we have a peak power of about 38 kilowatt and a time period of 24 hours. On this day, the system has produced 320 kilowatt hours. And what we get is a capacity factor of 28.6% and a load factor uh, of 35.1%. So this value is, of course, larger as we divide by the peak power. On the right hand side, on the other hand, a cloudy day, so the energy production is significantly smaller, just 88 kilowatt hours compared to 320 kilowatt hours. Uh, then we get a capacity factor of just 7.9% and a full load uh, and a load factor of 12.6%. Uh, so although the peak power is slightly smaller here uh, in the morning at, uh, let's say, 11 a.m., uh, the peak power is smaller, of course, the full load, uh, the, the load factor is uh, also smaller as the uh, energy which is generated by the system is uh, significantly smaller to the situation on a clear sky day. And you have to keep this in mind uh, with uh, if you um, calculate the capacity factor for different uh, energy pr production systems. Um, that uh, the values depend highly on the on the different situations, whether situations for the volatile energy systems like PV and wind, that, uh, of course, uh, the capacity factor and the load factor depend on good or bad weather conditions, as better weather conditions, of course, provide a larger capacity factor or a larger load factor. Another important uh, indicator ratio are the demand or utilization factors and the reserve factors. What you can see on this uh, diagram, we have again the energy production curve of the hard coal power plants in February uh, 2020 in, in Germany. And we have uh, the peak power of these systems on this day and the maximum power. Uh, P max, and what we can do is we can, uh, on the one hand, calculate the demand or the utilization factor FD as the ratio of the peak power over the maximum power. So this value gives us the ratio what is the peak power um, compared to the maximum power the system might provide. So this value, of course, is always smaller or equal to, to 1. Of course, what you can do is you can uh, calculate this value by dividing the capacity factor by the load factor or uh, to calculate uh, the full load hours by the uh, peak load hours. Um, on the other hand, the reserve factor R is the, uh, the reverse of this factor. So we have the maximum power over the peak power. So uh, in this case, uh, we would have a value of uh, about 2, as we have 25.3 20, uh, gigawatts over about 12.5 uh, gigawatts. So this is more or less 2 as the reserve factor. Um, again, of course, you can also use uh, other factors or indicators we have derived to calculate the reserve factor. And this value gives us, um, uh, let's say, the, the buffer you have uh, in this case. So we have twice the power which has been uh, produced or, on the other hand, uh, consumed on this day. So there's a, the, the buffer is rather large and sufficient. There might be no problem. Of course, if this reserve factor might get close to 1, uh, then uh, you might run into a problem uh, for the energy production and energy consumption ratio. But in this case, this reserve factor is fine as the value is uh, close to, uh, to 2. After the definition of all the indicators and factors, let's make an example uh, to calculate all these indicators. Um, what do we have? We have a system uh, with a nominal power of 120 megawatts. Uh, these green bars represent the, uh, the power of the system uh, in four different time periods. So uh, from um, 0 to 6 a.m. the system uh, runs at 80 megawatts, then from 6 to 12 uh, at 100 megawatts, then uh, the power drops to 70 gigawatts from 
12 uh, to 6 p.m. And then finally from 6 p.m. to 12 p.m. we have um, 90 uh, megawatts of uh, power generation. And the question is now, um, let's derive um, the in in energy indicators we, we've learned. So what is the energy provided or produced by the system? Um, then we want to know what is the mean power in this time period. We want to know what are the uh, peak load hours. So peak load hours. We want also to know what are the full load hours. And then, of course, we can directly derive the capacity factor on the one hand. Um, and, of course, the load factor. So capacity factor and the load factor. Uh, and, of course, we can uh, calculate uh, the demand factor. And, of course, uh, the reserve factor. And what you could do now is uh, just uh, stop this video and try to figure out uh, all these indicators for your own. And then we can have a look uh, at the result. The nominal power of our system is 120 megawatts. So this is P max. Then we have the peak power, so the largest power in our considered time period. So that is the peak power, power PP, and that is 100 megawatts. First of all, we want to calculate the energy produced by the system within this time period of 24 hours. So the energy is, in this case, the sum over the power within each uh, time step. So we have four time steps with uh, uh, different uh, power generation values um, over the 24 hours. So it's PI. We have four time steps. So it's P times the time interval of six hours. And um, if we calculate the energy, we have in the first time step a power of 80 megawatts times six hours. That is this time period plus 100 megawatts times six hours plus. And then in the afternoon, we have uh, 70 megawatts times six hours plus. And then in the afternoon, in the evening, we have a power of 90 megawatts, 90 megawatts times six hours. And that gives us an energy of 2040 megawatt hours. So you see uh, why this unit of megawatt hours is very useful uh, because you can directly uh, get the energy in megawatt hours. Next, we calculate the mean power. So PM, that is the mean power. And that is the energy uh, produced within the time period over the time period T. And that gives us a mean power of 2040 megawatt hours over 24 hours. So the full time period. And that gives us a mean power of 85 megawatts. So what we can do is we can just add this. This is the mean power over there uh, for 24 hours. So that's the mean mean power line of 85 megawatt. Next, we calculate the peak load hours. So uh, TP, that is the energy produced within our time period over the peak power. So that gives us a peak load hours of 2004, uh, 2040 megawatt hours over the peak power. That is 100 megawatts. And that gives us 20.4 hours. So in this case, what does it mean? Uh, this, the idea is that the system is running at this peak power value of 100 megawatts for 20.4 hours. So we are somewhere here. And um, that is uh, 
0.4 hours and um, that is the TP, so the peak load hours um, and then for the missing hours the system wouldn't produce any any energy and of course uh, the area of this rectangle of this peak power is the same like uh, the mean power uh, multiplied with 24 hours so the area of these two rectangles of course is the same as the area represent the energy which is uh, produced. Then we have the full load hours um, TF that is of course calculated in a similar way we have the energy but then we divide this value by the maximum or the nominal power so TF is 2040 uh, megawatt hours the energy divided by 120 megawatts so the nominal capacity and that is 70 0.0 hours. So that means the system is running at the nominal power of 120 megawatts for 70, 17 hours. So we are here and then we go over there and we have here 17 hours. That are the full load hours. Full load hours and of course again this rectangle uh, has the same size compared to the two other rectangles we have as the area represents now uh, again the, the energy and the value of the full load hours means that the system would run at the nominal power so the maximum power of 120 megawatts for 17 hours and then it would stop running uh, there's no energy uh, generation anymore uh, and uh, that is the meaning of the full load hours can now directly calculate the capacity factor. So uh, Cp is um, E over P max times T. So divide the full load hours by uh, the time period. So this is Tf over T. And that gives us a capacity factor of 0 0.708 or 70.8%. In the same way we can calculate the load factor uh, FL which is the energy over the peak power times the time period or the peak load hours TP over the time period and if we do this calculation what we get is that the load factor is uh, 0.85 or 85% and then finally we have uh, the demand factor uh, FD FD um, that uh, gives us uh, the or the, that is the peak power PP over the nominal power P max uh, and that gives us a demand factor FD of 100 megawatts that is the peak power over the maximum power the system uh, might offer or can offer and that is 0.33 833 or 83.3%. And then finally the reserve factor R that is just 1 over FD or the ratio of the maximum power over the peak power and this gives us a reserve factor of 1.2 or 120%. So with 20% buffer um, compare if you compare the peak power and the nominal power and that are all the energy indicators we can can derive from our energy system and which are very helpful to compare different energy systems or if you want to compare uh, systems of the same type um, and see what, what are the, the indicators of these systems the load duration curve is an important way to visualize and analyze energy production data or uh, the demand consumption of energy. What you can see here on the left hand side of this figure that's the power of the hard coal power plants in Germany on the 4th of February uh, 2019. So you see the slope of the curve with this increase in the high peak of 13 gigawatts in the morning then a drop of the power and then again increase uh, at 6 p.m. and then uh, the power production uh, decreases again and the load duration curve now 
helps to, to see how long uh, how was the time period of a specific power. So, for example, um, if you have a look uh, at this, this uh, line with a power of 10 gigawatts. So, what you can see here, we have had two time intervals with a power of more than 10 gigawatts. On the one hand, from 6 to 12 in the morning and then a second time period from uh, 3 p.m. to uh, 8 p.m. so five hours and six hours and on the right hand side uh, what you can see is now what do we do we, we take these power values and first of all we sort them uh, regarding their values so beginning with the largest value and then uh, to the smallest values so this is the slope of this curve and what you can now directly see on this low direction curve is how long a specific uh, power has occurred. Um, for example, this 10 gigawatts, you can see here this there's a value of 10 gigawatts. So in this time period, the power generation was larger than 10 gigawatts. So in this time period, or you know, time interval that is uh, larger than 10 gigawatts. And you can directly see, okay, this uh, corresponds to 11 hours. So 11 hours. Uh, during 11 hours, we have had more than 10 gigawatts of uh, power generation of these uh, power plants. And of course, the the area under this curve give us, gives us the, the energy uh, due to this equation that the energy is the integral over the power um, and the time from zero until the end of this, this period. In this case, with a period of 24 hours, so one day. And... Um, this this low duration duration curve then directly gives you the information of how long uh, power or energy demand occurs um, over a, a day, a month, a year, and this that's, that's very helpful for uh, the analyzation of uh, energy data. In this figure, you can see the low duration curve not only for one day but for the whole year 2019. So uh, the power of all hot coal power plants in Germany in 2019. Data um, is again provided by the Federal Network Agency. And uh, what you can see now is uh, on the one hand, uh, this the, the power values, uh, which is provided on a 15 minute interval, is sorted by the size, so uh, with the decreasing of the size, so the maximum load, the maximum power is 17.8 gigawatts, and then you sort the values until we get to the smallest one, so the smaller one is, is about um, one gigawatt of, of outcome within a 15 minute time interval. And what you can now derive are three uh, parts. On the one hand, we have the base load. So the base load means that or the, the base load, the power is the value which occurs at least for 6,000 hours in a year. Uh, so about more or less two thirds of the total time interval. So we have 8,760 hours in one year. And uh, the base load is the value um, of uh, the two thirds of the total time interval. On the other hand, the peak load is defined, typically defined as two thirds of the maximum load. So we have a maximum load of about 18 gigawatts. So the peak load uh, values are uh, larger than 12 gigawatts. So this is this um, marked region here in the upper part. So you see about 1000 or let's say 800 hours in this year, we have had a peak load uh, of at least 12 gigawatts. And the, the area, the third area is the medium load. So this is between the base load and uh, the peak load. Um, and th this load of course occurs for a long, longer time period. And um, these are the three sections of, uh, of a load duration curve with the peak load, the medium load, and the base load. One issue you can analyze by using the load duration curve is that you compare different uh, time periods. What you can see here on this figure are three curves. The blue one is the curve of the power uh, values of the hard coal power plants over one year. What you can see here, uh, both axes have been normalized, so the, the time is normalized running from 0 to 1. So 1 means for you, of course, 8760 hours. And on the other hand, also the power is normalized, so this the maximum value is normalized to 1 to be able to compare different uh, load duration curves. So the blue line is the uh, line we also already have seen. So uh, the uh, 15 minute uh, based values 
of the power generation of the hardcore power plants. And then uh, you see um, this uh, green curve that is the mean load direction curve of coal power plants in Germany uh, within 24 hours. So if you take all 365 days of the year and calculate for each uh, time interval, so for each uh, time step, uh, the power and average this values, then you get this green curve. So that's a typical day of a hard coal power plant. And then in, in orange, that's done for the month. So um, if you calculate uh, the mean power generation curve uh, of hard coal power plants for January, for February, etc., until December, and then average this monthly slope of the curve, um, then you get this orange curve which uh, has a, a slightly different uh, slope of curve than the day and the year. And this slope of these curves, the blue one, the orange one, and the green one, this is typical for the different uh, time intervals. Um, on the one hand, of course, uh, the, day, the daily uh, load direction curve has wide peaks and medium loads and a high base load. That's typical for a, an, an average day uh, low duration curve. On the other hand, the annual curve, the blue one, shows narrow peaks, high power, which only occurs a couple of days or hours, and the base load is even smaller compared to the, uh, to the in this case, uh, the difference is significantly, uh, can, be see, can be seen significantly. And finally, the monthly curve lies between the green and the blue one, so um, the, the peaks aren't that narrow, the base load isn't that wide, um, so a monthly average uh, of the load lies between a day and a year. And then you can see, um, of course, we need to normalize both axes to be able to uh, draw all three curves in a diagram, but you see that this load duration curve helps, uh, helps us to uh, compare these uh, slope of curves and do an interpretation uh, that the um, curve representing the year has a different slope than the uh, curve for the uh, mean daily uh, power production uh, slope. One issue about using the load duration curve is an approximation of this uh, load duration curve. So what you can see here in blue, again, the normalized load duration curve of the power generation of hard coal power plants. You see the x-axis is normalized uh, from zero to one. So one means uh, 8,760 hours. And the power is also normalized that the maximum value is uh, one um, instead of uh, about 18 gigawatts. And the idea is now is the way to approximate this blue curve of this annual power generation. Um, and uh, what you can do is you can do the pro or use the approach of this exponential decrease with uh, three parameters a, b, and lambda, so the exponent number and two factors a and b. Um, and of course, what we need is we need three conditions to uh, derive these three parameters. On the one hand, what do we know? We know that for t zero, so at the beginning, the maximum power, the peak power, is in our case one. So we are here for t equal to zero. Um, we know that the power is the peak power, or what we do is we normalize this. So in our case, with this normalized curve, this is of course one. So then, um, normalized uh, curve means that we divide the power by the peak power, or all values by the peak power, that the power is between 0 and 1. On the other hand, uh, we know the value at t is equal to 1, and then we know we are at the, at the end of our time period, so we have the time period T of 8760 hours in this case. So we normalize this that T is, is 1. And we know this is the smallest uh, load value. Uh, we call this F dot. So that's the smallest um, value we have. And we, we know this value, of course. And then finally, the third condition we need to determine, our, determine the, uh, the three parameters in our approach is that we know the area under this curve, 
this uh, is of course the energy if we do not normalize our load curve so uh, the energy is the integral over the power you can see this here in this equation but what we did is we did this uh, we, we normalized our value so divided by the peak power and the uh, time period so e over p and uh, t and that of course is the load factor that's the definition the definition of the load factor and the integral of this normalized uh, load duration curve of all uh, uh, normalized power values in the interval from 0 to 1 is fl and this value is also uh, of course known and what you, you can derive is the the hurling equation um, to describe this uh, this approach or this uh, de determine the three parameters to get this green curve you can see here in this in this figure um, which fits rather well to this blue slope of the curve that what we get is we get one plus one minus f dot so that's this value here uh, for t1 and then we have this t and then the exponent is fl so the load factor minus f dot over 1 minus fl. So that is the Hurling equation. And what you can do on your own is uh, to check if uh, this Hurling equation uh, is correct. Uh, so use this approach and set these three conditions. And finally, you should get these, uh, this equation. And this equation, in our case, uh, you see here both the values f dot is 0 0.025 and the load factor is 0.288 so with these two parameters we can describe these slope of the curves and uh, represent the normalized load duration curve and use this equation this Hurling equation for further analysis of our uh, system the diversity factor is the next indicator which is used um, in energy technology what you can see here uh, in this figure are four uh, systems or four subsystems um, uh, the yellow one the dark blue one then we have this light blue one and the energy production curve of this orange one and uh, the, the diversity factor is the ratio of uh, the sum of e of, of the single um, peak power values over the, the maximum uh, peak power which occurs within the time interval so uh, in our case what do we have you see in, in green that is the sum of the of the four energy curves so that is the slope of the curve um, just by uh, summation of uh, the four curves so you see for example here uh, at 7 pm we have a power of 400 megawatts and uh, about 200 megawatts gives us a total power of 600 megawatts of these systems uh, the blue light blue and the orange system do not uh, provide any power so both values are zero so that gives us 600 megawatts and what we need to derive the diversity factor is uh, what are the peak power values of each subsystem so we have on the one hand 1000 uh, megawatts uh, over there so the, that's the first spot then the peak power of the second subsystem is this one this is also the maximum peak power so p max is the maximum peak power then we have the uh, third system uh, this is over there so about 700 megawatts and finally we have the peak power of the fourth system that's over there uh, at about uh, one gigawatt and then we can derive the um, the diversity factor as the sum of these four values so let's say this is about 1000 megawatts this is about 1600 more or less then we have a peak power of 600 megawatts and we have a peak power again of 1000 megawatts so in these values uh, are used to derive the diversity factor so what we do is diversity factor this is the sum of these four values so we have 1000 megawatts plus 1600 megawatts plus 600 megawatt the peak power of the third system plus 1000 megawatts over the peak power of the whole system or the sum and that is 1600 megawatts in our case 
And now you can, you can derive uh, the diversity factor. Uh, in our case, of course, this value is larger than 1. So just um, do the calculation. This is uh, 4,200 megawatts or 1,600. So it's 3.2 or 3.1 if you take the correct values. Um, on the other hand, uh, what is also can also be derived is the simultaneity factor Ks, which is just the reciprocal uh, value of d. So Ks is 1 over d. You can see this here on the right hand side in this equation. Um, this is 0.32. Um, so this value represents uh, how what is the simultaneity demand or power production of the subsystems. Uh, if this value would be 1, then all systems would run on the same time with their maximum peak power. Uh, but typically, if you have uh, energy consumption systems like households in a city, for example, this uh, simultaneity factor is always smaller than 1 and typically in the range of uh, 0.3 or 30%. So that the maximum power is never achieved, uh, but uh, the system has an, a simultaneity factor of just 30% or just just 30 of the maximum power is uh, uh, demanded or consumed. The final indicator we need to introduce is the availability. First, we'll talk about the temporal availability. Um, this is the ratio of time intervals of uptime of a system with several subsystems to the aggregate of the time intervals of uptime and downtime. So what does it mean? Uh, let's make an example. Let's think about in this example of uh, a PV system with uh, two subsystems. Each system has a, a power of one megawatt. Um, so let's think about we have one system of our PV system um, with an inverter uh, with a capacity of one megawatt. And then we have a second uh, subsystem again with the PV modules. We have the inverter. Uh, to convert the DC power to AC power and um, capacity of one megawatt. And now what, what is meant by the temporal availability? The question is, this is here the way to the grid. And uh, now think about in the first hour, both systems are running. Then in the second hour, just one part of the system is running. So uh, the, this, the second system is offline. So in this case, let's say this subsystem is offline. It does not produce any energy for two hours. You can see this here over there. It's not running. And then in the final hour, uh, in the third to the fourth hour, uh, both systems are running and uh, produce um, electric energy. Uh, the question is now, uh, first, what is the temporal availability of the system? And the temporal availability, of course, is in this case 100% why the system is generating and feeding in the electricity. There is no total downtime, although a part of the system is not running, but the system is providing electricity to the grid, uh, although one system is missing. Um, so the temporal availability in this case would be 100%, although from the um, grid point of view, of course, we, we have just 50% of the capacity for two hours. So uh, the temporal availability just gives you an idea if this is a system uh, providing energy or not and does not differentiate between um, a reduction of, let's say, 50% in this case uh, of the power generation capacity. So it just can decide is the system uh, running or not. It does not decide or uh, contributes to the amount of uh, capacity what uh, the system is, is able to feed into the grid. The technical availability, on the other hand, represents the ratio of the generated energy over the sum of the generated en energy and the expected energy during a downtime of a system. So uh, let's think about the same situation. We have a PV system with two subsystems. So we have the photovoltaic modules on the left hand side with an inverter uh, with a capacity of one megawatt. And then we have a second system with the photovoltaic modules. We have the inverter. And this inverter is feeding the electricity to the grid. So that's the grid over there. Um, and now what we want to do is we want to calculate the technical availability, which means what, what do we do? We calculate the energy, which is 
produced during the uptime. Um, and we calculate the ratio over the uptime energy and the energy would have which has been or should have been produced during the downtime uh, if a subsystem is broken. So in our case, what do we have? In the first step, we have um, two megawatt hours. Then in the second hour, one part of the system is offline, so we just produce one megawatt hour. In this, uh, in the next hour again, one megawatt hour of energy production, and then in the final hour we have two megawatt hours. So in total we have six megawatt hours. That's E uptime. Now we have to uh, decide or calculate what is the energy which should have been produced by the system during the downtime of subsystem number two. In this case, this is rather easy because we see one system is online, one is offline, so we know. Um, in this uh, time period, we have lost one megawatt hour, and again, one megawatt hour has been lost uh, as the system was down. Um, so what we have is, in total, the energy during the downtime is two megawatt hours. So that's the energy which is lost. And this gives us the technical availability um, that we calculate uh, this, this, this ratio of this six megawatt hours over the total energy which the system should have been able to provide, that would be 8 megawatt hours. So in total we have a ratio of 0.75 or 75%. So the availability of the system is just 75% because two hours in this four hours time period, uh, one uh, subsystem was offline. And the one important issue is of course how to derive or calculate this energy during the downtime. That is not that easy, that's not a a straight away calculation. It, it depends on the system you are talking about. It differs. Is it a wind turbine, a coal power plant, a PV system? So you need different types of, of data to derive what is the energy during the downtime to calculate the technical availability. But this technical availability of value is very helpful to decide uh, is the system running on a high quality level or a low one um, as you uh, uh, consider um, not only the, the energy which has been produced, but also the energy which should have been produced during this uh, downtime period. And this is a very, very helpful um, value uh, to derive the quality of an uh, energy production system. This figure shows the technical availability of a, a large ground mounted PV system with a capacity of 50 megawatts. What you can see on the x-axis, that's the time period for uh, about uh, five months. And you see on the x, on, on the y-axis, the technical availability in percentage. And um, you see these green bars represent the technical availability, availability, which increases very fast. So there has been some outages in the beginning, in the first week of the year, uh, due to inverter or PV module malfunctions. Then you see we have a high technical availability of 95% over the time period. Of course, this, this values uh, or these bars do not represent just one day. That's the cumulative technical availability. So on the 12th of, uh, of February, you see this is the technical availability over the time period beginning with the 1st of January to the 12th of, of February. So we have in this time period of about six weeks, the technical availability of 99.7%. Then you can see here, there's a drop. Uh, this might be due to an uh, outage of, of an inverter. And overall, of course, you see we have um, availability of uh, more than 99%, which is achievable uh, for PV systems.